conversation, we record them. So that if you feel we need to share with you the, the footage, we have no problem with it. We can share with you, but it's also for our database and future reference uh, in our library. I don't know if there's anyone of you who is not comfortable with the recording side. I don't have. Okay, thank, thank you guys. Uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Livingstone Mchefa. I'm the curator for education and public programming at the National Gallery of Zimbabwe. I'm delighted to have you on this platform, Arara Conversations which is our series in terms of engaging people, citizens, artists, researchers, scholars, and all the different, you know, uh, uh, fields of study. But uh, most importantly, as a visual art center, we, the emphasis is really to say, uh, we are all artistic in a way, the way we behave, the way we, talk, the way we dress and everything. We are artistic human beings. So we are trying to connect whatever is happening in, 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 in Zimbabwe. Uh, we should connect as disciplines. We should connect as, as individuals and as institutions so much that we, we fit into the field of art. So today I, I have the pleasure and honor to have Dr. Mike. Uh, who is a lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe. Dr. Mike is, uh, has been working on, 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 on numerous publications and works that evolves around the evolution of childhood, uh, youth construct, uh, post-colonial state of childhood, uh, youth capacitation, as well as state failures or efforts in, in capacitating these youth. Uh, I would not uh, say much about him. He is a colleague in the history department and economic history as well. Uh, I, pardon me, I am not yet familiar with the new title of the faculty, but I know <laughs> the old name. Um, uh, that is Dr. Mike for you. Uh, I'm hosting as well, Mr. Tunga Mirai Zimond. Uh, he is the executive director of Youth Against Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, and also national coordinator for the Southern African Alcohol Policy Alliance in Zimbabwe. Mr. Simond also sits on the boards of international and anti drugging organizations like Movent, International and African Tobacco Control Alliance. Uh, these are my two important guests today but we are hosting them in observance of the African day. We are honoring the African child and the, this day is set aside, I mean, globally to, to really come up with initiatives that are centered around in, 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 in either celebrating, educating, or coming up with the discussions that also evolve around uh, the African child. So today we are contributing with these two experts coming in. Dr. Mike is, is a historian, is going to give us a historical work or the historical context of these childhood or youth constructs. And we are going to engage, uh, our second presenter will be Mr. Tungamirai, who is a practitioner, he's into these issues. He has so much work, and insights and issues around these issues. So I will not take much of your time. Uh, I will request Dr. Mike to, you can warmly give us, in, uh, you can introduce yourself in another way before you give us your, 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 your talk today. Uh, then thereafter, uh, it will be Mr. Tungamira to give us his presentation. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank you very much for uh, the generous introduction to Mark that you've given me. Um, there is not much to say, just that I'm interested in, you know, to do with this construct 
and how they interact with state power over time. And uh, for example, my PhD was on juvenile delinquency. How was delinquency constructed? And you find that you know, um, these social values that you know, end up constructing or normative values are always moving targets depending on the requirement and need at the time. So that's that's the Dr. Amike, you bit to be not so audible. I don't know if you can get your mic closer or something. Uh, maybe I'm the only one. No, I also don't get him well. Yeah, yeah. if you could work around your 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 guard, maybe to be closer or, or something. I've I've tried everything to <laughs> to maximize but, my. But but Hello? now 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 you now you are you are audible. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me let me proceed then. Um, yeah. So what what I want to just you know is to give to the panel as an introductory kind of uh, discussion is uh, childhood and youth constructs in, in colonial contexts. Then we move into the post-colonial context to ask what has changed and what has not changed. So you realize that uh, during the colonial period, um, childhood and youth were, you know, there, there was an overlapping, you know, boundary between childhood and youth, largely because there was, you know, political economy issues. The political economy of colonial capital uh, required sometimes uh, young people as, as, as young as 14 years old to be considered as adults. So you could not, you could not, you know, uh, separate childhood from adulthood or childhood from youthhood as we are able to do now. For example, it was largely because of the labor laws of the time where the insatiable colonial labor regime always wanted, you know, cheap labor on the farm, on the, on the, on the mines and stuff like that. So much so that 14 year olds were required to go and seek wage labor so that they will be able to pay tax, you know? So it was a labor issue. It was a revenue issue as well. So you find that you know childhood was very much violated. It was racialized, and at the same time, it was also ethnic. And if you look at you know parts of you know French and British Empire, you realize that not all whites sometimes um, uh, had the same kind of childhood. You know, some whites were whiter than others, so much so that childhood was not evenly distributed. So you realize that the political economy of you know, you know, colonialism violated the rights, particularly of the African child, you know, in a racialized way, uh, to the extent that you had childhood that had responsibility, but without protection. You had a child that had responsibility without real protection as to what is it that you know, uh, these African you know, children were protected against. For example, until the 1940s, for example, in, in Southern Rhodesia, you know, the African child was not recognized at law, you know, particularly 1949, that's when the African child was recognized as a child, you know. Prior to that, childhood was, a, you know, a prerogative of white society. So realize that you have this, you know, broadened childhood, broadened youth that did not have any 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 protection, but it, it it's you know huge piles of, of of responsibility. But what is important today is even against those you know difficult you know circumstances, you realize that you know African youths were not docile, they were not you know servile to their misfortune, the misfortune of being under the colonial law. And if you want to look at the history of you know the liberation movement. You can always place the youth at the center of that. You go to South Africa, you go to Southern Rhodesia, you go to any other place that you, that you can think about in terms of trying to break the colonial law. Colonial law. So African youths were always, you know, hit with responsibility, but they also you know, transcended 
you know, these are disadvantages that, you know, the colonial economy placed on them. And they were active people in trying to change the social circumstances, you know, of their race, you know, during the time. So beyond that, you realize that even the most significant prototype uh, nationalist politics when it began in the late fifties, it was led by, by youths, you know, you know, the Salisbury, so for example, the Salisbury bias boycott, you know, was led by youths. The James Keremas at the time were youths, you know, they took on, you know, uh, the colonial state. So you realize that African youths have always been active. And if you go to South Africa, you know, from whence now we celebrate this, you know, day of the African child, the 1976, you know, you know, massacres and stuff like that. The youth were always in the forefront or at the forefront of trying to liberate themselves, to recognize that they are agents of social change. Of these, uh, institutions that have been recognized as, you know, exclusively for whites, you know, became part of, you know, the African society as well. So the youth were capacitated to, to that level. But you realize that there were, there were problems within um, the, the African um, post-colonial state. The African post-colonial state and its economic failures, the African post-colonial state and its uh, political failures, the African post-colonial state and its uh, social failures, you know, started to impact on how the youths were perceived, how the youths were treated, how the youths were planned for. And increasingly you realize that because of the euphoria of, you know, independence and how the youths perceived this future to be, you know, they became nagging elements within the post-colonial setup where they were demanding more than what the post-colonial economy and politics could offer. You know, at least the pace was not commensurate with their actions. To the extent that you realize that uh, youths began to be con con constructed now as a problem. Youths as a problem in the post-colonial state. So that's, 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 that's where we want to come in to say, you know, much as, you know, uh, um, we have, you know, issues to do with, uh, you know, generational gap, interpretation of life and stuff like that. Now we have debates about millennials and how self-entitled they are and, and stuff like that. You realize that the post-colonial state itself has had its own limitations in how best to capacitate the youths, in how best to, you know, uh, construct the youths in a way that makes them feel part of the social transformations that came with independence. That's, that's where the disjuncture came, where the youth found themselves on the fringes of the new economy, on the fringes of the new you know, political you know, you know, transformations that were taking place, you know, these rebellious problematic youths. And you find them, you know, that term and that, that categorization, that construct, is, you know, pervades Africa. It's not just in Southern, in Southern Africa alone. It pervades Africa. So we are saying governments could do better, you know, especially given the role of the youths, you know, in our liberations, the role of the youths in social transformation, the role of the youths as the potential leaders of the future, you know. Governments could do much, much better than they are doing now to just say, I know we are failing to understand these youths, they have become a problem. So I think, you know, when those that are in, in, in practice, you know, the, the, you know, the practitioners come in when they talk about uh, uh, drug abuse and stuff like that, they'll be talking about youths who feel that they are not part of, you know, the, 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 the structures of the state and society who feel that they are outside and they're trying to construct a world of their own, a world of their own that they can make sense of, a world that gives them value because the one that is in place is not giving them that, you know? That's, that's where the problem lies. The youths are trying to create a parallel world where they try to find meaning of their own lives because the main structures are not helping them, you know? They are not included economically. They are not included politically. Socially, they are a problem and stuff like that. So increasingly, they are trying to create their own world. 
a world in drugs, a world in, in, in technologies, a world in this and that, where they can find sense and meaning of their own lives. And it's, it's within the part of the you know, certain failures of the post-colonial state. And it pervades Africa as a whole. I think I, I can stop here for now. Thank you, Dr. Mike, for giving us that historical context. Uh, the colonial and the post-colonial state of the youth and uh, childhood issues. Uh, that gives us a, a good background. Uh, Mr. Tungamirai is really into these matters practically. He is going to give us a talk that is going to complement and highlight some of the real issues on the ground, the challenges. And I'm sure uh, we are all to benefit from his uh, discussion with us today. <laughs> Mr. Tungamirai, uh, my brother, you can, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, Dr. Mike has really highlighted some very interesting perspectives in terms of uh, the youth. But um, I'll just get into um, what we do as, uh, in fact, like you mentioned earlier, I, I wear so many hats, so at times I get confused which hat I'm wearing. So as the founder of Youth Against Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, I'll kind of give like a brief of who we are. So essentially, Youth Against Alcoholism and Drug Dependency is a public health centered and development oriented organization that's committed to empowering and promoting healthy alternatives to alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use among young people in Zimbabwe. We realize that uh, substance abuse subverts the rights of young people and damages their ability to act as free and conscious beings capable of taking action to fulfill their needs. So I'm just going to give a brief context of the alcohol and drug problem in Zimbabwe and um, Africa. According to a paper uh, entitled Drug Use, Abuse and Alcoholism in Zimbabwe, published in October 2002, at least 3 million people in Zimbabwe are alcoholics. The paper projected that alcoholism will be Zimbabwe's number one social problem by 2022, which is next year. According to the World Health Organization Regional Office in Africa, more than 70% of young males and 40% of females aged 15 and 19 engage in heavy episodic drinking in Zimbabwe. Uh, heavy, heavy episodic drinking is uh, what the young people call binge drinking. And these are very worrying st statistics considering that young people constitute 60% uh, of the Zimbabwean population. While the exact number of drug addicts is not known, unofficially they're estimated to be between a million and 1.2 million countrywide. Police statistics in Zimbabwe put people between the ages of 15 and 35 as the major users and abusers of drugs. According to the African Union Plan of Action on Drug Control uh, 2019 to 2023, drug use escalated in all five African Union regions confirming that Africa is no longer only a transit zone in the global trade in narcotics, but also a major consumer. While cannabis remains the mostly widely used substance after alcohol, there is evidence of growing use of cocaine, heroin, tramadol, amphetamine type stimulants, as well as new psychoactive active substances, for instance, mutorido that's being abused by a lot of young people in Zimbabwe. The Pan-African Epidemiology Network on Drug Use report reported that young adults between the ages of 15 and 34 accounted for the majority of people seeking treatment in various African countries with the average age between 25 and 29 years. So I'm just going to go into a bit of uh, what we do as youth against alcoholism and drug dependency. Uh, one of the things that we do is that um, we do policy advocacy. Uh, this entails that uh, we lobby government and partner with decision makers to enable implementation and enforcement of alcohol and drug policies in line with their political commitments, especially those enshrined in Agenda 2030, the African Union Agenda 2063, and in line with the World Health Organization Global and Communicable Diseases Action Plan and in the global strategy and African Union Plan on Action on Drug Control. 
We also actively work with uh, civil society and mobilize civil society to support and integrate alcohol and policy advocacy as part of their mandate for development and social justice. We were actively involved in the formulation of the five-year national drug master plan that was launched last year and are currently lobbying for the enactment of the draft national alcohol policy as part of the Southern African Alcohol Policy Alliance. We also work with the media to amplify our message, also encouraging ordinary people to put their voice behind the call on government to put public health and people first. Uh, we also work with uh, regional and international organizations, uh, creating collaborations to promote the harmonization and acceleration of evidence-based alcohol and drug policy development and implementation in Zimbabwe, the region and Africa at large. We are members of the Southern African Alcohol Policy Alliance, the African Tobacco Control Alliance and Movendi International. And we have participated at local, regional and international fora, such as the Global Alcohol Policy Conference, the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs, the third ordinary session of the African Union Specialized Technical Committee on Health, Population and Drug Control, where we made submissions as part of civil society towards the African Union Plan of Action on Drug Control and Crime Prevention. We also do a lot of uh, community mobilization where we foster citizenship and community engagement at the grassroots level. We provide support, counseling, and recovery services to people affected by alcohol and other drugs. We also have a project that we're currently running called uh, Project Batsirai. And for those that do not speak Shona, Batsirai is a word which loosely translated is a call for assistance. Project Batsirai helps young people to cope with the alcohol and other drug abuse issues obtaining within, within their communities. The goal of the project is to empower the youth to become advocates for healthy, and possibility-oriented lifestyles free from alcohol, tobacco, and drug abuse. Objective is to build grassroots capacity, development, and socioeconomic empowerment of local youth at the same time, preventing and raising awareness on the dangers of alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, the project has a variety of initiatives, including Tambira, which is an in incubation hub Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we had to uh, close our operation. We also offer mentorship uh, opportunities for young people where they meet with uh, business people, artists, and sports people. We also believe that uh, sport plays a very important role in uh, building the character of young people. And we have an ongoing partnership with Atlas Fear Management, which is an organization that was founded by Gerald Sabanda, who is a former national and international rugby player. Uh, the organization develops sporting talent and nature's one to fulfill their fullest potential. This partnership will see YAD and Atlas Sphere man Management working together, giving a hands-on approach to talent identification, guidance, as well as mentorship by professional athletes. We also engage in arts and cultural activities to instill and enhance performance skills in students and encourage student initiatives on the promotion of gender equality cultural heritage, drug and alcohol prevention through performances. We have a concept that we usually hold on the 3rd of October, which we call the World Alcohol Free Day concept. We've also participated in the Associated Schools Project Network, International Women's Day Schools concept. And uh, some of the challenges that I think um, uh, that limit uh, youth empowerment is, I mean, it kind of seems cliche, but unemployment continually remains a, a, the big elephant in the room because thousands are graduating from high schools and universities, and already the country cannot support all these graduates. Due to the prevailing economic hardships obtaining in the country, young people who should be economically active are being drawn in a state of non-productive dependence on alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. That is serious health and so social economic consequences to the individual and country. I also think that the school curriculum is also a bit of a bit problematic because uh, the school system, instead of letting children follow the same routine, must help children identify their strengths by exploring their talents.
from a young age and growing their skills. Uh, so pretty much this is what we do as um, Youth Against Alcoholism and Drug Dependency. Over to you, uh, Mr. Livingstone. Uh, thank you, Mkoma Tungamira. Thank you so much for, for, for the wonderful work that you are doing. Uh, but uh, taking a leap from what Dr. Mike has just presented, uh, what sounds so familiar from colonial, post-colonial times is the police loopholes. Uh, from what Dr. Mike was presenting on, uh, it looks like the issue of adulthood or childhood was very vulnerable whether if, if we are talking from labor issues then 14 years was quite you know you were adult enough to be engaging into contract issues on labor uh coming to the post-colonial i don't know mr tungamirai uh, recently there was a report that said there was need for alignment between the children's act i, I don't know how to properly quote it and the constitution where the children's act is saying uh it says 16 years is the, is the age for you to be mature enough to make a decision but the constitution says 18 and some of the vulnerability that we are seeing in these you know minors comes from that you know uh uh gap where you know if it's the girl child just after 16 years she can be said to be concerned uh, and, and uh, adult enough to make a decision but then the act says 18 years. And this is the same situation in the colonial times where at 14 years you were subjected to, you know, labor issues. But the same age, you know, that kind of policy gap. What do you think of that, Mr. Tungamira, before we engage, uh, you know, panelists into this platform, the, the, the policy gap? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a bit of a worrying uh, situation uh, in terms of aligning. Um, that uh, age of uh, majority, because I mean, like from Dr. Mike's um, presentation, we realized that young people were actually at the forefront of uh, leading the revolution in Africa. And it's actually interesting because yesterday uh, we're also having another webinar. We, um, you know, I was just reading about how young people in Soweto were burning down shebeens and, uh, you know, saying, you know, I mean, these are young people, school children, the ones that eventually got killed at the Shabu massacre. So you realize that um, at a very young age, I mean, uh, young people are already conscious, like for instance, we're realizing that with the World Health Organization report, uh, the young people 15 to 19 are actually engaging in binge drinking, which means that these are people that are already able to make conscious decisions, though they might be termed to be minors, um, but there are people that are away. There they, they is that need to, to, to align with, 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 with the constitution, but then these young people are actually away. And another thing is that when you look at uh, Africa right now, the alcohol companies are actually targeting like uh, young people. So yeah, um, I, I don't really know how, how, how to balance it, but I mean, young people are very conscious, very aware. The young people that were part of the liberation struggle were young people, uh, teenagers. I mean, so I don't know where to, 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 to draw the balance there. Thank you, Mr. Tungamere, because uh, what is of quite interest, what is quite interesting is that, uh, uh, Taking a leaf from the liberation war narratives, it would seem and uh, that 14 years or those age that we are talking about, they are mature enough to 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 drive, you know, and to be engaged into those meaningful uh, and revolutionary events. Uh, but on this other side, uh, there is so much about their vulnerability, and that 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 dynamic where say that they are vulnerable or they are, you know empowered that capacitation uh i've also been looking into one other issue that i've been coming reading across uh which talks about school children you know in some places that are quite remote uh they are what we call satellite schools 
and these satellite schools do not have the facilities uh, to accommodate exam uh, for their children. So they will be they are supposed to transfer all their children or all their learners to other main schools for exam, you know, for examinations. But then it is where these cases of abuse and stuff, drug abuse, sexual abuse, and everything comes into place again. So, uh, Dr. Mike, apart from, you know, labor issues and the political issues, I mean, as main flagship aspects in terms of youth capacitation that we see there is really need at state level. From the social side, in terms of drug abuse uh, and these moral issues that are coming into play in the post-colonial period, did we have such situations in, in the colonial uh, era? in terms of the moral side, the social side, uh, that you feel the state could have done something in terms of capacitation, or maybe it's a post-colonial you know, uh, trend. Right, uh, let me bring in another dimension of, you know, while, while we were saying uh, childhood was being abused during the colonial period, you find 14 year olds, you know, entering into contractual labor obligations, some are be, were actually being jailed at 14 because the moment you enter into a contractual obligation, you're already an adult. And even when we talk about the Ching widows and the Mujibas, we are talking about these same ages, you know? And even if you want to look at uh, um, the so-called indiscipline within the revolutionary movements in Zimbabwe in the late 70s, they were called armed delinquents because some had left school at 13, some at 14, some at 15. But much as childhood was abused, adulthood quickly set in because of the element of responsibility. Because of that. Fine, you know, childhood was abused, but adulthood in the sense of responsibility, you know, quickly set in into these, into these individuals. To the extent that you find, you know, many of them you know, you know, achieving very great things at a very young ages. But the, the, the reverse is true now for the post-colonial state. For the post-colonial state, we, we now suffer the problem of weighthood, where adulthood is not coming. Weighthood. People are perpetual children. They leave university at 18, at 22, and at 35, they still ask for money for airtime from their parents. They are not financially independent. They are not economically independent. They are not you know, socially independent. They are still kids at 35 at home. You get it? So we now yeah. have a problem of weighthood. Adulthood is taking too long to come. Little wonder why these you know, youths are now creating their own worlds in drugs because there's no work to go to, right? They don't feel valued socially. Politically, you know, political parties always chant the youth are the future and stuff like that, but there is really very little that is being done to accommodate the youths in their numbers, right? So it's the youth that are now lost. They no, don't feel that they belong to this kind of setup and they are creating an alternative world in which they want to make sense of their own lives because of the problem of weighthood. Adulthood now is taking too long. Childhood is taking, you know, adulthood is taking too long to come. Childhood is taking too long to end. That's, that's where the problem is with, you know, the so-called uh, millennials, if you want. Adulthood is not coming. So the world is not making sense. And when you get to 35 and you're still at home, your parents begin to see you as a problem. And they don't see the greater picture of how is society structured? How is the economy in structured in this country? How is the politics structured? They blame it on you. You are the problem. You get it? So what do you do? You link up with your friend from next door. You know, you want to make your lives have some meaning. You link up with the friend next door. And before you know it, you're into this binge drinking, into, you know, uh, drug abuse and stuff like that. Because everything else is not making sense. Everything is else is not making sense. So in terms of capacitation, it should be a wholesome kind of approach. You know, it should not be only political. It should be economic. Stabilize the economy. 
so that people find you know uh, where to go when they in they leave school right it should be normal remember uh, back in the 80s and 90s companies would say come to use it at the end of every graduate uh, graduation and say uh, no no we want all your graduating uh, bachelor of accountants honors students we have work for them right now we have numerous universities and no work people just go to university to grow up you know it's not a means to an end anymore you know so so it, it has to be a wholesome a, a wholesome approach to youth problems it has to be socially driven it has to be economically driven it has to be politically driven we should not just stand at the pulpit and talk about you know the youth as the future capacitating youth and just give empty words let's act it you know the economy is not working let it work and it's not only zimbabwe it's the post colonial state that is a problem in terms of making its economy work and this, the 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 youths the children uh, they don't find meaning you know in of their lives in the current setup Thank you, Dr. Mike. Uh, that is interesting. Uh, it should be all, you know, inclusive in terms of uh, the programs. Uh, Mr. Tunga Mirai, uh, I have taken a leaf that you are also, you have a project that is called uh, Project Batsrai, which really looks into, you know, assisting youth uh, that are having problems with uh, drug addiction and stuff. A apart from that angle, do you have other, you know, social or economic projects that are also meant to rehabilitate them or to, to empower them in terms of capacitation? Mr. Zimont? Are you oh, there, Mr. Hello, Zimont? Uh Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Do you get my 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 question? Yes, I got it. So I was yeah. saying, like, uh, it pretty much uh, kind of sounds cliche, but then funding still remains one of the big challenge. You know, in terms of some of the initiatives that we actually want to carry out. Um, so we are pretty much limited in terms of uh, what we can do, and this is just like you know crowdfunding you know, working with other partners that believe in the work that we are doing, finding partnerships, you know, like in Shona, they say that So this is also the same philosophy that we work with in terms of, you know, the work that we do. Um, so we would love, like, for instance, to have a commune where perhaps we have a farm where young people can just work and do whatever they want to do. That's what we want to do. Thank you, Mr. Tungamere. Uh, what is your relationship as well locally with the uh, institutions such as uh, Zimbabwe prisons and correctional services uh, and some other, other major hospitals or health institutions uh, in, in, in such programs? Well, uh, we really do not have like kind of relations, but then we, 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 we're more into advocacy uh, work. So that's pretty much uh, what we'll, we, we, we work with looking at government institutions. And, um, you know, so for us with, with government, it's more about lobbying for government to enact, you know, public health centered uh, policies that at the end of the day, um, help our young people to become uh, better citizens and uh, better people because you know, drug abuse and alcohol abuse is, uh, is an impediment to development. It goes against all the uh, sustainable development goals. So pretty much when it comes to government, all we do is just lobby. Oh, thank you. But what is your comment in terms of, uh, from the statistics that you gave, uh, the projection uh, is that by 2023, drug and alcohol abuse will be the major social problem among the youth. Uh, is it something from your research, is it something that is coming from what Dr. Mike has been giving us uh, in terms of the historical context, or are there other issues that could be contributing to, 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 to that uh, uh, 
uh, kind of statistics as well? It's actually uh, a, a paper that was uh, published in 2002. That's almost like uh, 20, 20 or so years ago. And also judging from uh, the World Health Organization Regional Office on Africa, uh, it's, the projections are real because it's just next year and already we've got 70% of young males engaging in heavy episodic drinking as we are speaking right now, you know, and about 40% of females and the combined percentage is about 50%. 50, 50, 50%. So essentially it means that all the young people in Zimbabwe, half the population, half of the population of young people are engaged in heavy episodic drinking. And it's more worrying because when you look at it, uh, the population of Zimbabwe is like 60% of young people. So that essentially means that half of the population is engaged in you know, substance abuse. So, I mean, this is a very a worrying uh, situation and the government really has to step up and uh, enact the uh, alcohol policy because it really kind of works towards kind of dealing with uh, some of these issues. Already there's a, there's a draft alcohol policy, but then it's, it's just gathering dust because there's also that inertia in terms of implementing, you know, policies, not just in Zimbabwe, but then even regionally and continentally because, you know, like most people would actually be shocked that, you know, the biggest drug dealers are actually men that are wearing suits sitting in boardrooms, you know, because the alcohol company is actually the biggest drug dealers. Alcohol is the most abused substance in Africa, you know, but it's a legal substance and, you know, action needs to be taken quickly before we have, you know, a future that is just drowned in alcohol. Oh, interesting, uh, Mrs. Monty. Uh, I'll get you, you can take a leaf from the chat side. There's a, 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 a contribution by Nesta. Uh, but what I just wanted to, to, to find out from both of you, my, my, my guest today, Dr. Miken Tungamirai, recently, or we are, can say currently, we are in the lockdown, the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, what, what do you think of it? Is it really, you know, complicated or... Uh, multiplied the, 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 the drug and alcohol abuse levels in terms of in, in Zimbabwe or maybe across the globe. What could you say, what do you think would be the, 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 the overall net effect after this lockdown? Do you see what are the chances of, of, of you know, some of these statistics coming down or it's, it, with COVID or without COVID, nothing was going to change? Uh, maybe your comment, uh, Mike and his mind, I would let, but before you respond, let me read uh, from the chat site. Uh, Nesta is saying, Mr. Simond, you talked about engaging the youth in art projects. How is that going to be? And which areas of art are these? To what extent is this intervention assisting the youth? Maybe that you will come that later. Uh, for now, Dr. Mike, if you want to put into context the COVID-19 lockdown, what has been the overall effect? And what, where do you see us after this lockdown? I think I think we, we all agree that uh, the lockdown has fried all our brains across the world, you know, including adults themselves, you know, let alone a group of youths who were uh, trying to find their way in a quote unquote normal society. So I think the net effect will, would be things will actually get worse, excuse me things will actually get worse. Because even the very few youths who had, you know, one or thing, two things to do, you know, to eke out a living, find themselves shut behind closed doors and stuff like that. And that only serves to increase the frustrations that we've been talking about, you know, the frustrations of, uh, uh, you, know, you know, the lack of economic independence, the lack of political independence in terms of, you know, being your own person, staying at your own place and not being answerable to anybody and stuff like that. And being stuck at home with your parents for God knows how long. So I think overall, um, we we'll have to pick up more problems because of, you know, the lockdown and COVID, you know, uh, and, and COVID issues. And I think it's, it's a global problem. 
is not only localized, it's actually a global problem, but we had our own specific problems, you know, locally, where in certain other parts of the world, you find governments trying to, you know, uh, give some people some form of relief, financial relief. And out here, you have your ukiakia closed out, and at the same time, the government is giving you nothing, you know, and that only serves to compound the problem. So I think, you know, the net effect will be we have an increase in these problems. Thank you. Mr. Tungamira. Oh, yeah. So uh, just to answer um, uh, Nesta's question, uh, we, we work with uh, um, musicians. We also work with uh, visual artists. Uh, I mentioned that uh, we had uh, an incubation hub, but then unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we had to close down operations. But this was a space where young people come to mix and mingle and to co-create. And uh, as one of the things that we did, I think that was in 2018, um, pretty sure. Um, we, we took a couple of young people uh, for a trading session in terms of you know, alcohol policy uh, issues. And then we also engaged artists and came up with a song uh, that kind of advocates for substance abuse prevention. The song was, uh, is called Malunde. It was made by DJ Discord uh, from Afrique. So Malunde is essentially a song about a man who lives his life halfway through. You know, he, he wastes his money uh, buying alcohol. He doesn't pay school fees for his kids. He abuses his wife and all those sorts of things because we, we believe that, you know, personally, what I believe is like the artists are the voice, you know. You know, when the artist speaks, uh, people listen, you know. Uh, when the artist speaks or, for instance, even like influencers, uh, yesterday was kind of an interesting day because we had uh, Paul Pogba though he's not an artist, he's a sports person, but then he's an influential uh, person. Uh, there was a press conference where there was alcohol on his table and he was just taking a cue from uh, Ronaldo. Uh, after Ronaldo removed the uh, Coca-Cola from the table, he removed like a Heineken beer that was on the press conference table. So, you know, the artists are actually vehicles for change, you know? Even, even if you talk about uh, the post uh, the, the pre-colonial state, like what uh, Dr. Mike was saying, music played a very important role in the liberation of this country. So it's the same thing even now when you're talking about substance abuse and other uh, social uh, issues. You know, music plays a very important role. Even if you go to the church, cultural activities, music still plays a very important role. So. That's pretty much why we, we work with artists and uh, try to engage them to see these positive, you know, issues that we're talking about. You know, the, the alcohol industry has got a lot of money and a lot of artists eventually sell out because they need to feed their tummies. But then at the end of the day, they are making a lot of young people then get into substance abuse. If you listen to a lot of Zim Danso songs, you know, they were singing about uh, Guka Makafela. I didn't even know, like, for instance, you know, Soldier Love's song, Television Team, was actually like a song promoting, you know, crystal meth. So this is the power that art has when it comes to uh, social issues and changing the narrative and changing the minds of young people. Thank you, comrades. Uh, there is a comment on the chat side uh, by Wesley. He's saying, I think the breakdown of the state's capacity to enforce national laws is featuring a lot in these conversations. In your expert views, what should be done? Because he, he, I think he's, he's concurring with what uh, Tungamire was saying. Some of these, you know, uh, culprits, they're actually sitting in the boardrooms. And they are, they are not just, you know, <laughs> ordinary people uh, who are fueling, because in a way it's actually a legal business to some. So Wesley is saying, I think in the breakdown of state's capacity to enforce national laws features a lot in these conversations. So what? 
you know, expert views should be down, should be done, I think, to arrest the road amid the collapsed state. How viable are such interventions? If, 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 if this is the situation, uh, to use these words, a collapsed state, how viable could be such interventions such as, you know, Zimond and others are working on to? Uh, I, I, your comments, but this I extend to everyone in, 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 the, in, the, in, in, in the discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are free to contribute. You can just, by way of raising your hand, uh, show uh, that image where you can click and you can show that you are raising your hand. Uh, and then I will let you speak. Uh, you are free to contribute. But Dr. Mike and Tungamere, how, what can you, how can you respond to this one by Wesley? Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a complicated you know situation because even if you want to look at um, uh, the problems in the United States of America with you know drugs like oxycodone and stuff like that, uh, these you know uh, medical but abused drugs, you see the power of big pharma you know arm twisting politicians in in the Senate and and there is really very little that is done to punish these guys because they control a lot of you know, money and they can arm twist the hands of politicians. It's even, even more worrisome when it comes to quote and unquote, a failed or collapsed state as you know, Wesley wants to put it. You know, it's, it takes a concerted effort for you to come out of the mess, you know? because if you are saying you know, things are not in shape and you have these powerful entities that control a lot of money, that can influence what politicians say and what parliamentarians say and what kind of law goes through and what kind of law should not go through. It becomes very, very, very difficult. So it's not a, it's a developing world kind of problem alone. It's, it's an international problem where you have big money controlling politics and it takes a lot of effort for you to come out of that, of that mess. Thank you. Yeah, I, I concur with uh, Dr. Miki. Uh, like I, I alluded to earlier, um, you know, like uh, these non-state actors, uh, corporate gangsters, actually are the ones that actually, you know, like kind of influence policies. They even sponsor politicians. Some of the people that eventually get into power are actually sponsored by these guys uh, in some shady boardrooms and stuff. And it's not just in an African uh, situation, it's, 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 it's a global uh, situation. For instance, I, I talked about alcohol policy. And when you look at um, you know, African alcohol policy, um, there, was, there was a research that was made. And you know, we had these um, uh, people with vested interests like the alcohol, alcohol industry coming in and trying to influence and actually influencing a lot of policies in, in, uh, in Africa. And you know, this is a kind of situation that seems like you've got criminals that are actively engaged in constructing a prison that would eventually incarcerate them. Would you think that those criminals would create a prison that would, you know, kind of incarcerate them for life, or they would create a prison that has got loopholes for them to like, you know, if they escape when they get incarcerated? So this is this is the conflict of interest that then arises when we have these commercial uh, interests, I mean, co commercial uh, organizations with uh, vested interests coming in to influence like uh, uh, alcohol or, or, or drug policies, whether it's in Africa or any other part of the world.
Hello. Yes, Rafael, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mchefa, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mike and um, uh, Tungamirai. I, I just wanted to, to, to ask a question to Dr. Mike because he raised a very important issue in terms of um, this uh, idea of weighthood to adulthood, which I think it's, um, it's very important. And then the other issue which I want to extend is uh, the, in, the issue of entitlement that the young people of today have how can we get over that? And um, yes, as much as we want to put the blame in the shoulders of uh, uh, government and, um, and other uh, institutions, but what can we do as parents today? Because we've realized that the weighthood to adulthood is becoming a bigger challenge to the youth of today and what can be done? What is it that can be done so much that um, when uh, my son or my daughter graduates uh, from university, he does not lumber in this weighthood to adulthood um, uh, 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 disease. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much for the question. But uh, we, we can't we can't answer the question by discounting other factors, you know. <laughs> because if we were saying, you know, we need to we need to capacitate the youth, we should start at the state level, you know. We should start at the family level. We should start at the community level. But sometimes you realize that capacitation, it you know. Uh, family level and community level falls apart if we are not capacitated at state level. So you can't you can't have an answer that discounts you know you know other factors. Much as I understand you that all right, fine. Let's say the the state has failed us. What do we do? Uh, I think we should also need we also need to change our parenting strategies. Parenting strategies. That's where the concept of you know the problem of entitlement is coming from, you know, and I was listening to this you know uh, you know uh, talk the other day, you know about millennials and how entitled they are and what the problem was. The problem was is parenting, where you know kids are told they are special, which is nice. You want to build their confidence, right? They are told they can have whatever they want as and when they can want they, they want it. Uh, the the mod and environment of technology now gives them the, the impression that everything is, is is at the click of a button away you know but the reality of the world that they live in is not like that you know so at family level the parenting strategies have to change you know if your kid has to earn five bucks you have the five bucks as, as the father or as the mother but let them say, you know, wash your car first so that they understand that life, you know, you know, gives, you know, when you work, you know, not just, you know, give them $5 just like that. You are, you are trying to instill a skill in them, a, a social skill that life is not that easy, even when the money is there, but I might not always be here for you. You know, that's, that's one thing that we have failed is particularly Africans, you know, the parenting skills that we instill in our, uh, the, the parenting skills that we use and the social values we instill in our kids are almost always wrong. You know, when I have money, I want to spoil my kids. I have got these, you know, you know, companies and entities, but they don't even have the slightest of clues as to how those entities are run. You know, all they do is to, you know, hit the money and they hit the money. So in terms of development, there is nothing that is coming out of, of that. So we need to change our parenting skills. I think it's a very critical element where kids are supposed to be taught that it's a tough world out there, you know? And life is not like being on Instagram. Life is not like being on your phone, just, just click, you know? In the first world, you know, you want something today, you click on Amazon, tomorrow it's delivered. But out here, it's, it's not that easy. 
but even even in, in the first world itself, those kinds of belief systems, the thing that you can have whatever you want at the click of a button, you know, don't always work. And let alone in, in failed economies like ours, you know, we need to change things, toughen up our kids at, at family level. And we need the community as well, you know, to help us. And we also need the, the state to capacitate us rather than say we have 60% of, of the population, uh, you know, below 35 years of age. But you really see, you don't really see you know, you know, changes, real changes in policy shifts to try and accommodate that reality, you know? So we can't say at the end of the day, ah, no, we can't just blame the state and stuff. You know, the state I feel is not doing enough. We have 60 plus percent of young people as the, as the population, but that is not reflected in policy, you know, approaches. It's not, it's not, you're told, ah, no, you know, at, at X age, you are too young to be this and that, but that's the majority of the people. So we are losing that badge of people, you know, by approaching life that way, you know, we need to accommodate our young people, you know, as they grow, you know, capacitate them at state level, at community level, and let's toughen up at family level. That's, that's how I feel we should, we should approach this problem. I just wanted to come in when you are talking about the, the issue of uh, parenthood, which I, I, I think sometimes charity begins at home. Because when you talked about the issues pertaining um, that the, the, the issue of everything is within a click of a button. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just want to look at it from a, a perspective that sometimes you can't buy experience. The, yeah. the, the entitlement we, we see, I mean, we, we work in, in these institutions and we do other works outside where we are looking at it from a perspective of saying, our, our voluntary attitudes in the past were mm -hmm. higher. Mm -hmm. And the, the incentive which was there did not even count mm -hmm. for us to get where we are. But today it's, it's, it's like you said, that it's a click of a button as much as it is out there, but even today out there, where I mean for us, I mean, we're the privilege to live both lives, both here in Africa and abroad. Even out there, you have to work for, for something to happen. It's not just a click of a button, but the, the idea of um, parenthood, which I think it's, a, it's also very important and, and a key, because as, as much as if you have very bad parenthood, if you are given an opportunity as a youth, what you, 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 are, you are instilled when you are at your parents' house, it's what you want to do when you come into a workstation, but it's, 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 it doesn't happen that way. You have to, to, to get that experience for you to get at the top. It's, it's not just a, an event, um, it's, it's, it's a process for you to, 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 to be empowered. And, and I'm sure for, for me as a parent, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm learning a lot from what you're saying that um, this is where the root cause, as much as yes, we, the, the government also has to play its part in terms of looking at this 60% to make sure that whatever we do, the 60% of the youth is also looked after, which is a very valid point. But, um, the, the, the parenthood, it's, it's a very, very critical point, which I think is a takeaway for, for, for me as a, as a parent to, 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 to us, for us to, to, to have a, a, a change of mindset in terms of how we, 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 we grow our, our, our children. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you uh, very much for, 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 for that. Uh, there's Lizzie there, she's uh, raising a hand. Liz, can you contribute? Uh, thank you, uh, the panelists, to this conversation. Um, Dr. Nike and Simondi. I, I am just uh, so privileged to be part of this uh, conversation where I also have questions as, we, as I listen carefully to this conversation to say, um, 
the history part that Dr. Mike gave us. Uh, uh, and post-colonial state now is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, um, the day of the African child. Um, even looking at the topic that we have, they are forging the fires of the future. Where I'm saying, um, just putting together what, what I have heard from different people contributing, we, we have a challenge here, way taught that we are talking about, um, where adulthood is, is very hard to get to with our young people. And I'm like, what exactly are we looking at? What are we talking about? We are talking of empowerment, of economic freedom. We are talking of social freedom uh, for these uh, people, young people. And um, I'm just thinking, um, much as we are doing this, I'm sure most of us here are above probably the ages. Uh, why not also have uh, maybe another conversation to actually hear from these uh, people, these young people speak their voice, um, uh, hear them speak of the challenges that they, they also have. And I also do suggest uh, probably talking of the economic um, empowerment that we, 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 we claim to, to say to, to, to the young people, maybe we also need to implement, we need to practically have these young people um, be empowered uh, truly than just having uh, 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 things on paper, you know, the policies, yes, the, the, the plans are there, yes. And we, we do have these things um, programmed, but the implementation, the, the, the actual doing of, of the, uh, what we are talking about, I think is the critical part where I suggest also uh, that whatever we are doing, I think engagement is very important, inclusive of the uh, affected people who are the young people and not a blame game to probably say is, is, is the adult uh, or maybe is the young people, um, is the children or is the, is the parent. Uh, here we have a, a challenge, that's my thinking. We have a challenge which I think we need to listen carefully uh, from each other to know, to hear the challenges that, uh, that which we perceive, because I want to believe when you say um, young people, are, they are a challenge, obviously it's, it's the adult that is looking at uh, the young person from his point of view, from her point of view, uh, but um, from another angle, that young person also has his own or her own um, uh, perception of the adult. So what am I saying? All I'm saying is here is a challenge in the post-colonial state where I want to believe Africa, not only Zimbabwe, but across the continent. I think whatever interventions, whatever, um, just like this conversation, uh, I, I really want to thank uh, the organizers to this, that if we can have a spread of such uh, where we want to be inclusive, to hear, to let that voice be heard of uh, the two parts and, and probably find workable um, uh, way forward uh, in order to have a better, a better space for both of us in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz, for, 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 for that wonderful, you know, comment. Uh, I, I, I think I, I will learn from it that um, uh, we should not speak for the youth, but these are research findings. Anyway, 
they still remain valid. And also like Tungamira has uh, said, uh, the blame is also on us, it may be as the adults, you know, in terms of the police issues, it's not their responsibility. Uh, much of it in terms of the blame is on very, you know, pronounced institutions that are run by adults. So uh, as a summary to, to, to what our guests or our presenters have been deliberating on, much of the issues have been about the police gaps, you know, national laws that are not compatible, that are also giving room for those, you know, abuses. And uh, infrastructure, you know, we set up from the side of Tungamira and his, 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 his work, his work actually, the challenges that they are facing and the wonderful work that they are doing as well. Uh, there's a comment there, some, some of the young people are listening and pop them. Okay, that's fine, that's coming from Raphael. I think in our next dialogue, we should try to engage some of these, you know, critical uh, stakeholders, the youth themselves. Um, our, 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 our guest tonight, our guest today, actually, sorry for saying tonight, I'm used to hosting these events at night. Uh, are there any comments that are coming from our, 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 our panelists? I don't see any end here. Any contributions? Well, there was, we uh, an, yeah. there was an interesting um, uh, comment that was made about, you know, like uh, that generation gap between the adults and, uh, and the young people and the importance of the family as being an institution that actually kind of holds young people to be, uh, become better, better, better citizens. Because when you look at like uh, the post-colonial Zimbabwe, they had a very good relationship with their, with their elders. You know, they were told that, you know, this country was taken and, you know, they, they, they were very conscious of what had happened and they made a concerted effort. You know, that class of 1960, 1970 is pretty much different from like the post-colonial generations and uh, not to place blame, you know, but then I think post-independence, there was that euphoria of independence and, you know, the, 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 the same youth that actually managed to get the country independent just kind of got excited and then forgot the essence of what the struggle was all about. And they also failed to, you know, like impart, cause it's a relay, you know, impart the same essence of the struggle because I don't know who say this, but then they always say that the struggle continues. The struggle is never ending, you know, it's a relay race from one generation to the next, and even Franz Fanon, I think he says that each generation has got a part to play. You know, each generation has got its part to play. The post-independence generation had to liberate the country. And then the post-colonial generation, perchance their mandate or their mission is for economic, you know, independence. But then there's always that need for, for like dialogue between the post-independent and the uh, and then in the pre-independence generation so that, you know, people sit down, they talk, they discuss, they dialogue, because dialogue is always important, you know? And if people do not sit down and talk, there's always room for, you know, like outsiders to come and influence, you know, what, what the young people eventually become. Even if you look at this whole alcohol and drugs, or, you know, you have our young people that leave the country for the so-called greener pastures, because they feel like, you know, Zimbabwe, Kumusha and so forth and so forth. They, they don't have the idea that you can actually work on a farm, you can work in mining. We've got all the resources in this country for everyone in this country to actually benefit uh, from the resources, but it, it needs all hands on deck, you know? So even if you look at substance and drug abuse, it's not just because there's uh, a failing economy, even in rich countries, you know, there's a, a growing epidemic in the United States, you know, like fentanyl, you know, like America is a, is, a, is a very sophisticated and rich country, but they've got a growing crisis in terms of drug abuse. So it's just a matter of us sitting down and then charting and finding who we want to be as, as a people. I think that's just my contribution. Thank you, but but, but Tungamirai, what do you suggest to be the most viable platform for such a dialogue between the old generation and the young generation? Uh, because I understand there are a lot of other, you know, 
engagements, but they are not fruitful from what we are discussing in this platform. What would you comment to be the most viable platform for, for, for such engagements? I think the most viable platform is the family because the nation starts at the family level. So if parents sit down and have conversations with their children, it eventually translates and trickles down to the, to the nation state because the nation state is just but a conglomeration of families. So everything that happens at the national level uh, starts at the family level. So if you see problems at the national level, it means that you know, it's starting at a family level. So I believe that's the first platform. Mm. Thank you. Uh, now let me get your final remarks. My two presenters, Dr. Mike and Ismond, your final remarks to this discussion. Before we open up, if there's another comment, then we can close up. No, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mchifo. Um, just to highlight, there is a book coming out very soon, in a few weeks. I think it's already in print. Uh, we have a press you know, publication. I contributed a chapter in that book. Uh, it's entitled Fending for Ourselves, Youth in Post-Colonial Zimbabwe. So it has very many perspectives about youth, politics, society, and, and stuff like that. I think it's one major you know, contribution to perspectives on youths in the post-colonial state uh, that people might be interested you know, in. Then the other thing is, you know, one of uh, our colleagues here was asking about, you know, parenting skills. What can we do to capacitate our, our children at home? You know, the greater society has failed us, so to speak. What can we do? I always, I always marvel at how, for example, if you were to walk into, um, a shop owned by an Indian, my India. You know, a grade three child comes from school, does not go straight home. They go to the shop. They do their homework at the shop. By the time they get to grade seven, form one, they will have inculcated into their heads a lot of business skills. By merely observing their father do stuff, you know? And if they were to take over that business, it would never fail. You know, they will be challenged at form two, you know, to make orders, to do this and that. You know, the father wants to know whether the child has learned something. So at home, if we have the capacity to start small businesses, let's start small businesses and involve our kids, you know, so that they know that money does not just come easy like that. You know, life is, is, a, is, a, you know, is, a, is a tough thing, you know, you, you get by, by through hard work. That's how you make them experience some of these things. That's how they pick some of these social skills, very valuable social skills in life, rather than rely on, you know, click of a button away. You know, is it two, three weeks ago when we laughed about uh, a, a, a young man who almost died after fasting to get a Lamborghini? You remember? It was in the papers, you know? He almost fasted to death. He felt entitled that he should get that Lamborghini. And he thought miraculously by merely fasting, it's going to work, you know? That's the other side of the coin. An Indian child who is, you know, given skills by the father over time, by coming to the shop almost every day after school and observing and learning stuff. And one who just feels that they are entitled to a Lamborghini. And if I fast for 40 days, I'm going to get it, you know? Those are the two contrasting kinds of philosophies of life that we have, you know? And, uh, you know, much to, to our, all our, our, our agreement, you realize that, you know, you know, Indian businesses run from one generation to the next in the family, you know, and they never fail. And they never fail. They will tell you, we started in 1840 and this is 2021 because the skills are given generation to generation and it works. And you root out this sense of entitlement where somebody is on the verge of death because they feel entitled to a Lamborghini, you know, you know, for which Lamborghini they have no money anyway. So let's let's try and capacitate our kids. Like, you know, one of our, my colleagues was saying, you know, charity begins at home. Let's try and do these small things at home, so that the kid learns that money does not come easy. It comes through effort. Sometimes it doesn't work. You know, if you want $5 to go and buy pizza, 
you watch the this car and it gives you eight bucks and you go and buy a pizza and you know so that you know it just, it's part they know that in life you have to work nothing just comes simply because you want it thank you oh thank you for 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 those you know powerful remarks uh what are your concluding remarks Well, uh, my concluding remarks, I'll just quote uh, two of my favorite Pan-Africanists. Uh, the first one is Franz Fanon. He says that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. And the second one is uh, Captain Thomas Sankara, who says that we must dare to invent the future. So those are my concluding remarks. Oh, thank you. Uh, but uh, I would want to, if there's not anyone, you know, uh, raising up here, uh, Dr. Mike, when are you expecting to launch your book? I would want to invite you to to, to, to use our space for, for, for that, you know, kind of a powerful book. We have got a lot of constituents around the youth here, and uh, I think that should be wonderful. Uh, consider us, please, in, in your book launch. Uh, I'm just bidding, you know. <laughs> I, 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 uh, yeah, we've had a plan to launch it on the 29th of June, but because of the COVID restrictions, I think that has been scuttled for now. So it's a prerogative of Weaver because they are the publishers. I just contributed a chapter there. and uh, But it's it's diverse. We have practitioners, we have academics, we have, but we are all talking about perspectives about youths in the post-colonial state. Mm. Uh, no, no, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the wonderful time that we've been going through this discussion uh, as we are in observance of the African child. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Mike. Thank you for admitting to, 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 to be part of this discussion. Thank you as well, Tunga Mirazimond, for the wonderful presentation and for accepting our invitation to be part of this discussion. Thank you everyone for coming to join this discussion. Uh, until we join again next time, I'll always extend you know, the invitation every time we have got something to be talking about as National Gallery of Zambia. Thank you, enjoy your day. <laughs>